All right, so after that example problem, I thought I would show you guys, um, you'll get tired of my examples because you'll know what all I'm working on in my house. Um, I wanted to show you how I'm using statics to try and avoid killing myself. And I don't mean killing myself because I'm depressed, because I'm not depressed at all. That's not what I mean. I mean in an accident. Remember I told you about that concrete I'm cutting that's about six foot by eight foot. Well, I've made a cut about there and one, oh, about there. Well, so we just a little bit. And I calculated the mass of this whole thing and the weight. It was about 4,800 pounds. I think I told you that. And I've actually got this piece loose. I've pried it with crowbars. And now, if I draw it from the side, if that's the, let's see, how do I want to do this? Let me draw it from the side over here. So if I draw it from the side, so I'm looking at it this way, and that cut is right about there. And the piece that's loose is sitting here. We can look at it from the side. But I've actually pried it to where now it's about like that. Now the reason it's sitting there that way is because there's dirt up to about here all in behind it. So it's sitting against the dirt. Okay. But I stopped the other day because I thought, you know, I'm not sure this thing's going to fall the way I want it to. And I'm kind of in the way. And I don't feel like dying tonight. I'm getting tired. I'm going to bed. That's enough. And so I quit. Which is probably a good idea if you're feeling tired and you're working with something. Because I, I didn't even know how much it weighed. I thought, I wonder how much it does weigh. So I did some math in my head the other day and came up with about, how much was it? 1,200 pounds, I think. Something like that. So it's a decent amount of weight. It certainly would crush me. Could crush a foot or a hand or something, I'd lose it most likely because it's it's a lot of weight. And uh, I was thinking about it, and I thought, you know, I was trying to pry out from the bottom, just kind of hoping it would slide down the wall, so to speak. Does that make sense? And that way, it doesn't fall catastrophically or anything. But I, I also thought, you know, if I did that, there's a possibility that one of the ends would start coming off first and it would sort of rotate down. That's also possible, right? There's many different ways that this thing could come down. And I thought, you know, maybe I'd be better off to put a force up here. Why? Because I could attach a chain or something. I could be over here, if you get the idea, and pull it. How much force would I have to apply to pull it? So I started doing some math. Assuming the center of gravity is here, so the moment arm, sounds familiar, doesn't it? I know this height. The moment arm is roughly half that height. How much force do I have to apply? Because now I'm applying a moment arm that is twice the amount, roughly, right? So I've got a sort of a two to one ratio. So how much force do I have to apply? I calculated in my head about 120 pounds. That's what I came up with. And that has to do with the thickness of the wall and the geometry and all of that. And I may have done the math wrong because I was just sitting thinking about it. I didn't draw it or, or do any calculations by hand. It hasn't fallen. I'll let you go. No, I've got a sucker. I mean, a guy coming to work on it. <laughs> actually, I've got a better idea. It's actually really difficult. This line I didn't cut. It's actually sort of a jagged crack line. And that's one of the reasons it's been so difficult to get out. So what I'm going to have him do is safely make a cut there. And then this bit will just come out. So we'll have more room to work. And he and I will work together, probably doing that to get it to come out. And that way we're both out of the way and, and safe. But my point was, I used statics to figure out, is it even practical for him and me to connect something there at the top and pull on it and get it to come off? Will it work? Or do we simply not have enough force in our arms, force in our legs, you know, because think about it, we're standing back on one leg, basically our center of gravity is back behind, and we're working against that. Why not just push it? What? Why not just push it? Because I have no way to get back here. Ah. That's why. And that's the whole reason for cutting the door in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I don't show up someday, it's because I found a box of gold in here that somebody buried years ago, and, <laughs> and I'm done. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'd come back to see all of you. In my Porsche? <laughs> no, it would be Corvette. All right. Anyway, so that finishes Chapter 5. And you can see that even in the home, applications of this stuff is relevant. Right? It's useful. It's very useful. Any questions so far? Have you seen any places where statics have started to appear for you? I know one student, as I said, sent me a picture of a playground. said, hey, there's statics here. Anyone else?
Yeah. It's okay Drive if you have it. What's that? Drive across, the drive across the bridge. Yep, sure. Statics is, at least you hope it's statics when you drive across <laughs> the bridge. A buddy of mine lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, he took me across a bridge and we were on it. It was actually not a bridge, it was a ramp up to a bridge. And he said, oh, by the way, this is that ramp section that collapsed, killing 30 people five years ago. Something like that. You know, here we are yeah. in the middle of it, and I'm like, oh, I hope they did it right. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so we want statics to actually work. TV come back on. One thing that I've thought about is just like the statics and building, and also yeah. like how the force applied to each part of the building has to be like increasing. Yeah, that's an interesting point. How the force, like I was yeah. About like, like if you have like a color scale of intensity, you know, like at the top of the building it would be like your lighter colors and then it would... It comes more towards red, yeah. something that's under more load. Yeah, you're right. A skyscraper, think about the massive load yeah. that a skyscraper applies to its foundation. And then you begin to understand why you have to take that load and spread it out somehow. For example, yeah. <laughs> it all ties back to my house as well. I told you about how my driveway washes out and what I want to do is build an archway essentially It'll look pretty, and it'll look like it's stonework when I'm done. But think about it. If you've got all this earth for the driveway above the arch, well, can the dirt actually support the arch there? Actually, dirt doesn't have a real high compressive strength. The dirt will just kind of squish out of the way, especially over time. And so commonly what you have to do in a situation like this is actually build a footer, which expands the load out and spreads the load out over a larger area so that the soil is capable of bearing that force. Go ahead. Uh, well, it's, it's a totally off topic question. It's okay, what is it? Uh, why do you think, so you know how the Burj Khalifa is constructed, it's got like those columns that go down into the sand? I actually literally just started watching that about a week ago. I was yeah. interested, and they run electrical currents. Yeah, why is there electrical current? There? To avoid uh, galvanic action. So what'll happen is the metal will corrode and it's not just rust. Rust is only one type of corrosion. But yeah, the metal will literally go away and not be there. Is there any place in your home where you have intentional corrosion? Anybody know? My truck. In <laughs> my truck? <laughs> my truck's got a lot of corrosion in too. That's, a, that's why I bought it. I don't like pretty trucks. I like trucks that if I beat them up, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> there actually is a place in your home, most likely, where you have a sacrificial anode, it's in your water heater. Yeah. Because what happens is over time, it's used up and it prevents corrosion of something else. I can't remember what. But basically the anode is sacrificed, it ends up going into the water. Some of it comes out, you drink some of it, you bathe in some of it, it's not, don't worry, it won't kill you. Some of it stays in the tank and then you need a new water heater eventually. But yeah, there is a place that galvanic corrosion is resisted by a sacrificial anode. So it's a similar situation to that. Yeah, that's an interesting point to bring up. Speaking of skyscrapers, a lot of times there's so much weight you can't distribute it like this. And so what they'll do is they will drive piles into the bedrock. So you've got bedrock eventually, which is a lot more sturdy material, and they'll drive posts essentially into the bedrock. And there the idea is that the friction on the side of the entire length provides support rather than just the base and just pushing up from the bottom. So they'll drive multiple piles and then build their foundation on that. So for transferring the load down to rock. And is that how the laying tower pizza became a thing? That I don't know. I, I, think, I think the ground itself under the leaning tower moved, didn't it? I don't know. I think that's the case, but I haven't looked into that. It's a good question. Any other questions, comments? Well, then let's go on into chapter six. <coughs> I should turn it on so you can have access to the presentation we're about to open. Now, I will confess I'm just a bit behind. I haven't actually worked out any example problems from this chapter yet, but that's okay. What we'll do is if we make it through the slides before the end of class, which I think we'll likely do, I will uh, just grab a problem that looks interesting and we'll work it. All right. And it will become one of our examples. I usually like to go through and select examples a little more carefully, but really the principles we're studying are pretty straightforward. They might be difficult for you to recognize in multiple different contexts, but we really only have a handful of concepts that we're trying to master in each chapter. 
All right, so what will you be able to do after this? Define a simple trust, determine forces in the members of a simple trust, and identify zero force members. We'll come back to the reading quiz later because, of course, I don't require that you read ahead of time. Applications. You might have seen trusses in roofs. How many of you went to the job fair today? What company here specializes in trusses? GHK. GHK, yeah. So they, all they do is trusses. If you ever get a chance to go see their process, you should. I toured them a couple months ago, I think it was. We've got a former student working there, and they want more of you guys because he's doing a good job. Please continue to keep Purdue's reputation high if you go to work wherever. <laughs> I'm sure you will, I trust you. But um, anyway, what they do is they actually have huge metal tables that have slots in them. And some of them have sort of these metal pegs that move automatically for whatever truss they're building. And they can then align the boards against those metal pegs. But primarily what they have are laser systems at the roof that shine down, they, they paint squares essentially in the location where the board is to lie, which is pretty cool. They've, I think they've got some green lasers. I think they show up better, but they've got some red lasers as well, as I recall. Anyway, so that you lay down the members where they go, because of course this is all uh, computer generated, right? You've, the trusses are designed uh, on computer, and so you just transfer that information over the laser. It lays out, saws are programmed to automatically cut it proper lengths to some extent. And then you lay down the pieces, and what they'll do, they've literally got guys running around, maybe a team of five to ten, and they'll lay mending plates on the joints. Tap. They don't drive them all the way in with their hammer. They give it one or two blows at the most. And then there's a roller that comes across. Think about a truss laying on its side. The roller comes across and squishes all of those plates into the wood all at once. So it just goes back and forth in you know, 30 seconds or so. Of course, it's helpful to not be in the way of it as it goes <laughs> squishing the truss. But anyway, they'll actually put the back and front plates on all at once, squish it, and you've got a new truss. I saw them build one in five minutes, something like that. At least the, the assembly portion of it. Right? There's some preparation, getting the material and cutting it and all those things. But anyway, trusses are very common. And of course, they're used to support roofs, but they can be used for many other things. In fact, we'll talk more generally about frames, because a frame can be thought of as something that is used to support weight. For example, there's a frame right in front of you in the table you're leaning on, or that you have your computer sitting on, or that your book's sitting on, right? And that frame needs to support the loads applied to it. Now, it's designed to only supply certain loads. Think about it. If we all decided to have a party and all jump up on one table, we'd be down one table in this classroom, wouldn't we? Because it's not designed to hold that kind of load. The table would fail under the combined weight if we could all fit on the table, which I don't know if we could. I don't intend to get that close. I'm just kidding. For a given truss geometry and load, how can you determine the forces in the truss members in order to be able to size them? So let's say that you have a given load that you must support. How could you determine whether or not a given truss design could support that load? Well, as long as the load in each member is below the load that that member can, can hold, then you should be fine, assuming the joints are strong enough. More challenging question, question, given a load, how do you design the geometry to minimize cost? This is actually the problem I'm dealing with right now. Uh, I don't have a lot of memories from my very early childhood. My oldest memory is one of being burned. I was not burned horrifically, not over my whole body. It was over one leg. I have no scarring or anything. Um, I was so young at the time, it didn't, you know. But I remember seeing this green grate and a flame behind it. I guess I leaned against it or something. I was probably one and a half, two years old, something like that. My parents said I screamed bloody murder, and, you know, that probably did, you know. And I healed, and I'm fine. But I brought that up because I have somewhat of an aversion to fire, <laughs> naturally. I'm not scared of it. In fact, I use a boiler at home to heat my home. And it's been really interesting to learn about fire and how it works, and there's a lot of similarities between the way a flame moves and the way the smoke moves, because a flame is burning smoke, interestingly enough. So there's a lot of interesting things to know about fire. Um, however, I'm, I'm wary of it. I'm careful. In fact, at one point, I thought I'd like to build a home where it was primarily concrete and steel, so there wouldn't be as much flammable material. And then I learned that the furnishings in a home are primarily what burn. <laughs> so the structure, yeah, sure, a structure can become engulfed, but you're going to have a nice, toasty fire in a home. That pretty much destroys everything just off the furnishing. So, so good luck. And besides, uh, walking around on concrete all day is kind of hard on your knees. So a little bit of give in the flooring is actually a good thing. So I live in a typical stick-framed home, two by six walls, and so forth. But in my workshop, which I have yet to build, I've got too many projects. But that's one of them. I want to build a workshop. I thought, you know, I want a roof that 
will be somewhat fire resistant. So I don't want to use wood trusses, I want to use metal trusses. And it turns out there's actually a company in Madison that uh, installs overhead doors and I got all of my garage door from them for free because they throw out parts like crazy. I stopped by and asked them one day, I said, hey, can I go through these and get some parts? And they said, sure, help yourself. I got a garage door opener, I got the panels, I got the track, I got the springs. Just by taking pieces from all the stuff over the period of a month or so that they were throwing out. Because obviously one or two panels might be bent and nasty, but then you've got a couple of panels that are okay. So I've got a 16-foot garage door, garage door opener, worked great, love it. I even installed the torsion springs myself. You've got to be careful, you can kill yourself in yeah. installing torsion springs. But anyway, <clears throat> so if I've got this source of track, that's metal track, I thought, you know what, why don't I build a truss, or tr all the trusses for my workshop, out of that metal track. So what I'm trying to do is, given the sort of odd shape I've designed for this workshop, how do I design a truss? And that's really the question here. How do I design a truss? Minimizing material, because I'd rather minimize my number of, of travels out to Madison, right? My old beater pick, pickup truck with the price of gasoline. I might ought to just buy some trusses and be done with it. But minimize the cost of acquiring the material, the amount of welding and cutting I would have to do to build the truss, and yet support whatever snow loads or wind loads could be expected in our area. Probably over-design a little bit that way if we are in the Ohio Valley, after all, right? You never know what's going to happen in terms of wind loads here. In fact, the wind's blowing pretty good outside right now. But that's a really a more challenging question. I haven't found a good way to answer it. There are some ways to answer it that are automated. Artificial intelligence, as you know, is becoming more of a thing. And you can actually use something called genetic algorithms to design sort of a random truss, and design a whole bunch of random trusses, see which one works best, take the best of them, mate them together, so to speak, but randomly assign different uh, attributes of each to a new baby trust, so to speak, or daughter or son offspring trust, and generate thousands of them and actually use genetic algorithms to make a design that uses minimum material and has maximum strength. Kind of an interesting way to design things. Or you could sit down at the computer and you could make several different geometries that are practical for you to build because you know how Cutting, you know, you can't, it's hard to cut just any arbitrary angle, but a 45 degree angle is easy, for example. Right, so you could design several, evaluate them from statics, and then see which one holds the most load. But how do you do that? How do you calculate the load in each of the members and in each of the joints? That's what we're going to learn. And of course, there are many different types of frames that involve trusses besides simply bridges. And these trusses need to support whatever load we're going to apply to them. And often, for the sake of weight, things like the space station use a frame truss like this with a skin over it uh, rather than a solid piece, right? If you wanted to support a, uh, if you think about a round piece of pipe, you might just uh, make a round piece of pipe with a thick wall so that it's strong, but you can't really turn that into a rocket ship very easily. Much better to have a thin skin with a support structure beneath it. Okay, so here's a lightweight structure that's sort of a, a different type of crane. This looks like a shipping container. No, that's not a shipping container, horse. That looks like a, a bridge walkway that moves up and down. Have you guys ever seen the train bridge go up or down? Ever see that? It goes across the Ohio River. You should watch it sometimes. Pretty neat. But basically, they can raise and lower it to allow larger watercraft beneath it in the locks, or they can lower it to allow trains to go across the rails. It's kind of interesting. The other day, I was driving along. I wanted to stop because there was a train stopped on the tracks with its lights on. And I was pretty sure the bridge was moving down, but it was moving very slowly. I wanted to watch it. So all these things use trusses. So what is a truss? Well, it's a structure composed of slender members, and a lot of times we will treat these members as just lines in our analysis, not as members with any thickness, that are joined together at their end points. Okay, so those end points are called joints. Uh, in um, mechanism analysis, you might call them pairs of joints. So if you think about it, if you've got two members pinned with one another, well, you need a hole in each one, right? And so that's a pair that goes together. Pairs essentially reduce the number of degrees of freedom that a, a member has where it can move. Think about it. If this member was not pinned here, it would be free to rotate. But it would not be free to translate if we're holding the rest of the truss constant, right? Not let, allowing it to move. Anyway. All right. If the truss with the imposed loads are all in a plane, then it's called a planar truss. And those are the most common kind, at least for buildings. But there can be three-dimensional trusses as well. Uh, a simple truss is a planar truss with a triangular 
element, what begins with that, it can be expanded by adding two members and a joint. You notice how each of the members, anytime you have them, they're, they're in groups of three, they're in triangles. And the reason for that is you don't want them to be able to move. So for example, a mechanism, something that does move, might look like I showed you last time, I think, where it's a four bar mechanism, say pinned to ground here, and this actually has an ability to move. And it doesn't have to be drawn this way. We could draw it this way, and it would still have an ability to move. Because now this would be called a crank, and this would be called a rocker, because this member can actually rotate all the way around like a crank, and this member would rock back and forth. Hopefully you see what I'm saying. So we've got, how many members are there here? One, two, three, four. You see that? Because these two, we assume, are connected together. They're both ground, and therefore they're connected together. This is not statics. This is dynamics. But this is statics. And you'll notice that for trusses, we always have three members connected together in a triangular form so that they cannot move relative to one another. If you're interested in the relationship between the number of members and the number of joints, there's an equation there for planar trusses that works. But I'm not going to harp on that. We won't really use that for anything. All right. So, analysis and design. Let's look at all the rules. When designing the members of joints uh, and joints of the truss, you have to determine the forces in each truss member. This is called force analysis. There's two assumptions we make. All the loads are applied at joints. This is really important because you guys know that the way a truss for a bridge looks is something like this. You can see where all the joints would be and so on and so forth, right? And you know that the goal is to span usually a body of water or vein or something, right? And so supports out at the end. We assume that those supports occur at the joints. We also assume that any loads occur at the joints. You might say, well, that's not fair because a car is not like an electronic. It can't skip positions from one to the next. This is not quantum mechanics. This is the real world, right? So certainly a car is going to be here applying a load. In fact, it's going to move across. How could it be possible to apply a load to all the joints if typically we talk about a bridge? Well, maybe the road deck is designed such that it only attaches to the joints. You see, and so basically there's some other structure that basically serves to bridge the gap between the various joints. This is what we're assuming. And if you look at bridges, you might notice that that's actually the case. You might go on the walking bridge and look for elements like this. Uh, of course, suspension bridges are a little bit different, right? So the new bridge across 65 doesn't follow this, but these are, we're talking about truss bridges, okay? All right. So loads are applied at joints. The weight of the truss members are often neglected as if you was a small by comparison to the force that the members support, okay? The members are joined together by smooth pins. What that means is that there's not gonna be any torque at the pins. There's nothing to consider there, okay? The, the pins allow free rotation at the joints. Um, however, if you start looking at a bridge like the Second Street Bridge, you might notice that where members come together, there are actually plates with multiple rivets that prevent rotation. You might say, well, all the stuff we learned in statics is no good because in the real world they do things differently. Actually, there are some joints that are simple pins. However, those plates that are used are really not there to prevent this motion, right? Those plates are actually there to just form a good joint. And actually, if the bridge started to fail, some of those plates would simply be ripped apart because the forces are so large in the bridge structure. So even if you see something where it looks like you're trying to prevent rotation of one member relative to another, sometimes yes, but sometimes no. Sometimes that's just the way to connect them together. Okay? So we make these assumptions because they are reasonable. With these assumptions, all the members are two force members, and this makes our analysis a lot easier. And that's really important because then rather, whether the forces are in tension in the member or, or cause the member to be in compression, they lie along the same line. And that is really important for us to be able to analyze these various um, members and determine the load within them. Okay? However, buckling is its own unique thing. So when we talk about failure in members, compression members are particularly concerning. But we won't talk about buckling until you get to strengthen materials to a level. Okay. 
So how do we analyze these things? Well, we use, there's two different ways. There's something called the method of joints and the method of sections, okay? The method of joints, the idea is, let's extract a single joint, for example, point B. Let's make a free body diagram of point B and consider the forces applied to that point. For example, there are external loads potentially provided. If we were to analyze A, there would certainly be a reaction load from the ground, right? But then there's also force from the members attached at that joint. And now that we know that these members can only have force along their length, now we know the direction of those forces, don't we? And that helps us a lot in our analysis of the free body of the pin at B. You see what I'm saying? And it helps us a lot. It makes our lives a lot easier so we can actually do the statics math to calculate what's going on in the, the members of the truss. Okay? When using the method of joint stall forces and truss members, the equilibrium of the joint pin is considered. I said that all forces acting at the joint are shown in a free body diagram. It's really important to make a free body diagram of each joint that you intend to analyze so that you can write some force in the x and some force in the y equations to talk about what's going on in that pin. Notice there would be no sum of moments. So in the method of joints, we can't use the sum of moments when we're analyzing a single pin. We will occasionally use the sum of moments when we're analyzing reactions, but we won't take just a pin that's pinned to ground. We'll take the entire structure and perhaps calculate the moments. So if we go back to this bridge that I drew on the board, um, notice that if we knew there was a certain amount of traffic distributed along the bridge, then we can actually calculate the load. Say we had a distribution of traffic such that the weight ended up distributed something like this. We could use sum of forces in the vertical direction and a sum of moments equation about this point with the entire truss as a free body to figure out what's going on between those two forces, you see? And so I'm not saying we'll never use the sum of moments equation, uh, you know, the equation of equilibrium. Uh, when we're using the method of joints. It's just that when you're analyzing a particular joint, you do not use a sum of moment equation for that joint. Okay. Steps for analysis. If a truss's support reactions are not given, draw a free body diagram of the entire trucks, get the reactions. Okay, so those are the, all the equations of equilibrium, the sum of force and sum of moment. Next up, draw a free body diagram of a joint with one or two unknowns. Assume all the unknown member forces act in tension unless you can determine by inspection that the forces are in compression. So when we draw a point, a joint, what we'll do is assume that all the members connected to that joint are in tension. And if we get a negative force, we know that that member is in compression instead. Okay? Apply the scalar equations of equilibrium, the sum of force equation, to determine the unknown. If the answer is positive, it's tension, we were right. If it's negative, then it's compression. Does this make sense? That's pretty much all there really is to the method of joints. I would suggest that you keep these steps handy until you are used to them. To me, they're somewhat second nature, but uh, to you, they are probably not yet. I think your book, I think I saw, I was glancing through the chapter. Yeah, here we go. Page 267 has a procedure for analysis. That page is probably worth a tab until you get used to this. Okay. 267, Procedure for Analysis, a page worth tabbing. You'll get used to this pretty quickly, I think. It's not a terribly difficult procedure, but uh, it may not be second nature to you. And then in the slides, I say repeat steps two and three to, at each joint in succession until you figure out all the forces and all the members. And that's not part of the procedure for analysis, but it, it's pretty obvious that's what you would do. Okay? Any questions so far? Well, let's take a five-minute break, and when you come back, we'll pick it up from there. Will this be on the exam?